My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF. Because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's worth mentioning too that uh, you know van nomadism is a really, really good interim lifestyle, and obviously there are a lot of folks that are lifers that that do it forever. Um, but it serves as a really, really great interim lifestyle to get uh, you know it's a it's a it's a good easy freedom strategy to or lifestyle change to you know knock out first before you go on to the ones that are going to get more and more complicated. <laughs> We are just some modern day abolitionists looking to rid the world of the last vestige of slavery. Statism. It's the Seeds of Liberty podcast with Andre, Dave, and Jeremy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 154th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. All right, so we are back. This is Jeremy. This week, we do do not have a full packet of seeds after back-to-back weeks of that. Uh, Dave, unfortunately, Dave's not here, man, which, uh, as most people know, is usually a positive for me. But anyway, moving on, uh, Shane and Andre are both here tonight. What's going on, guys? Hey, what's Hello. happening? All right. And uh, it's, speaking of Shane, it might get a little confusing tonight because um, uh, we, we do have a guest. Uh, returning guest whose name is also Shane. Uh, so this this may be interesting. <laughs> uh, but our friend, our, our friend and uh, friend friend of the show, uh, Shane Radliff from Liberty Under Attack and the Vanu Podcast, has returned. Shane, Shane R. What's going on, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> hey, not much, man. Not much. Just uh, got off work earlier today, and then been recording podcasts since I got home. So uh, yeah, I had you on my show earlier today to talk about uh, had you on Vanu to talk about your uh, begin your uh, journey that's beginning here in a couple of weeks and uh yeah just you know a night of a night of podcasting yeah yeah it's uh well it worked out well we scheduled yeah like you said we, we had scheduled for, for for me to be on your show because well as we've discussed plenty of times here we're not going to really go into it today but uh you know my situation uh I, I think i mentioned it last week we finally got an official closing date uh may 31st once that at, at, by that point i'm going to be living out of my car with murder dog and yeah uh, shane was nice enough to have me on one of his shows in order to discuss that and uh, what i'm going to be going through and uh testing some stuff out on the road and trying to experience uh all of this and go for an adventure and hopefully learn some things and uh gain some information for myself and some other people and uh see where it takes me so yeah and uh, ho- hopefully obtain a little bit more freedom right now so but yeah but enough about me uh yeah so like i said we we have you back here and we were trying to think about it before and as always i'm horrible about looking this stuff up i do know that we had you on episode 105 to discuss the vanu podcast uh, right before you started it, you were talking about the idea about it and how you you got you had discovered all this all, all the uh, information about it, and you were trying to look for more, and you were going to do this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we had you back since then. We might have had you once back to discuss it, but either way, it's been a while. Uh, so, if you don't mind, really quickly, if you just want to give uh, our listeners who may not have heard at least uh, the term Vanu, or as we were discussing earlier, we pr- we pronounce it wrong, but we don't care. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, what what that actually means, and uh, what your podcast is all about and uh and then we'll get into uh what you're up to and what your plans are for the uh hopefully relatively immediate future as well 
Right, right. So, so yeah, Vanu is uh, it's an awkward contraction of the words voluntary, not vulnerable. So it's the V O from voluntary, the N of not, and the U in vulnerable. It's uh, yeah, awkward to, to say the least. Uh, but it's premised around becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible, both from public coercers, governments, and private coercers, uh, criminals. Because even in, even uh, in Encapistan, uh, even without without the state, there's still going to be violators of person and property. So regardless of the the situation that uh, you know we find ourselves in uh Vani will always be relevant uh so that's 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 what it's all about is uh making lifestyle changes in pursuance of becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible and that's a really wordy way of saying that but um <clears throat> so some of the life some of the lifestyle changes out there uh van nomadism which is uh what i'm most interested in uh at this point it's uh, my interim lifestyle to minimal sailboating uh hopefully sometime in the future uh there's wilderness Vani, which is uh, a really hardcore version uh, rayo the main guy who uh i I guess developed this freedom strategy. Uh, he lived in a polyethylene A tent uh, most of the year in the Siskiyou National Forest in uh, Northern uh, California and Southern Oregon. Uh, so I don't know many people that want to, you know, live in a tent in a national forest nowadays. Um, but that was uh, that. That is one possibility. Uh, there are things like uh, intentional communities, uh, which uh, mobile and uh, stationary ones. Uh, those are Vani lifestyle changes, um, and uh, I guess there's there's obviously some some other ones too. But that's a, a, a good start. So that's that's what Vani is all about: is becoming as influential to coercion as humanly possible. So yeah, there you go. Awesome. And uh, well, you mentioned you know you mentioned one of the options. Obviously, van no nomadism is one of the things that you're uh, you're you're looking to go after. And uh, as we discussed when we recorded for your show earlier, I'm kind of doing a. <laughs> variation of that or at least going to attempt to in the coming weeks and the other thing you met one of the other things you mentioned was, was intentional communities which obviously i'm a huge fan of because that's something i plan on doing as well once i finally get out of here uh so yeah a, a whole bunch of different freedom strategies uh, i'm obviously a big fan i've talked about this a bunch before we've me we've mentioned it on the show a bunch of times even when even when you weren't here we've brought it up a bunch of times because uh it, it tends to be relevant since since we tried to start gearing more towards solutions around here at the seeds of liberty rather just than just complaining all the time despite how really really good i am at complaining i mean so much so that i have awards um i have the proof anyway uh speak, right. speak no, for yourself should, you're not the only one that's good at complaining hey andre actually and i should i should make something one thing one thing really really clear when it comes to vanu um is uh that there is no political crusading uh political, political crusading is a bullshit strategy for bullshit libertarians as rayo put it uh so that's a, a contentious thing to say but uh you know to to really to really, really hone in on what Vani is and what it is, and I kind of have to say it. So uh, <laughs> there you go. Yes, yes, I, I agree. Good, good point. Um, so yeah, so like I said, I'm, I'm obviously a big fan of this stuff, and it's uh, I'm looking to do some of these things too. But as far as the van uh, nomadism thing goes, uh, myself, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm just going to kind of wing this and do it partially and also in a position where a lot of people won't be able to do so which is where i'll have a safety net um if i if if right. i do screw up too badly things you know i'll be able I'll, I'll be all right but uh you're you're looking to take it on a more permanent scale or you know at least for the time being and uh you know you, ha you have a timeline laid out and stuff like that but uh maybe you maybe if you want to go into that a little bit about uh what exactly uh what you're you're doing what your plans are and what you're looking to do uh to get as far away from the uh hands of government as possible possible yeah yeah so so the, the plan right now is uh to be on the road by the beginning to to the middle of 2019 um that's the goal and i i think that's that's actually quite manageable uh now the reason i'm not hitting the road now because obviously uh you know i <laughs> if i could be doing it i would be so um why am i not doing it uh, immediately well it's a it's a pretty major life it's a pretty drastic lifestyle change so i'm i'm, I'm implementing things slowly rather than uh you know tossing myself into an extremely uncomfortable position um and then trying to uh, adapt to all of these things so you know minimalism frugality um i'm getting passive income streams set up because i have to make money on the road and i'm gonna quit my job whenever i do this so uh, i've got to have ways to, to to make money on the road so i'm getting some of that stuff laid out writing uh writing a book right now which should be should be out uh, at the midwest peace liberty fest in paperback copy but uh, we'll see if that if that happens i think it will um but um <clears throat> but yeah just, just right now i'm just getting get, getting things kind of set up and i I do have uh, some credit card debt I need to take care of before I hit the road. So I'm getting that taken care of. Then I'm going to buy uh, buy the van, uh, which at this point, it's, it's going to be uh, like a Ford E-Series van or a Chevy Express van uh, or something something like that. Uh, probably, you know, 1990 to 2005. Um, that kind Ford. of year range with... 
Yeah, uh, that's, I'm leaning more towards a Ford. Obviously. Yeah, the, the there Ford, we go. Uh, Ford that's Econ. my boy. Yeah, <laughs> yep. That's uh, I'm a, I'm a Ford guy, but I'm I'm keeping my options open because if a really really good deal comes out for you know a newer a newer year with lower miles, I, I you know I. I, I, yeah. I might go with the Chevy, but it, yeah, it just no. depends on what's of, of course, there. of course. And you want to get the best bang for your buck, but uh, you know, yeah. I bleed Ford blue, so of course I'm going to uh, try and nudge you in that direction. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. And obviously, I, I'm trying to avoid uh, you know as many breakdowns as possible. So as long as the Ford, um, you as know, long I've, as I've Ford, always had great luck with Ford. So as long as the Ford vans are more like the trucks and not like the cars, you're in good shape. Right. The, right. E1, the E150s are like the trucks. They're actually extremely reliable. They're very dependable vehicles. No, that's good because Ford right. cars. I see. Dead, I see a lot of them out there with like three hundred fifty thousand miles on them. So like they're they're beasts. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. So so yeah, that's uh, so then I'll, I'll get a van which I'm I'm already shopping right now. Found a really really good deal. I was for a Ford uh, E Series van, and um, it's yeah, it was like uh, nineteen hundred dollars, and it had like a uh, hundred hundred twenty thousand miles, and uh, you know it was it was ready to go. And I, I almost pulled the trigger on it, but I, I stuck with my plan uh, because I didn't want to have to, you know, go into more debt. Because uh, the the idea is to um, the the van nomad lifestyle is really really cheap. So um, and and the idea is the is to not have to work as much. So I don't want to have a bunch of debt, you know, to take care of while I'm on the road because then I'll have to work more. And the idea is, you know, I, when I when I hit the road, I want to work maybe like two two three months uh, per. Uh, two three month permanent or uh, temporary positions uh, a year, and then have the the other half of the year to travel. Um, so that's what I want to do. So I don't want to have any debt go- debt. Uh, you know, when I when I hit the road, and uh, I want to get some savings. I want to make sure I'm pr- fully prepared, and I want to have plenty of time to uh, convert the van into a uh, into lo- into a, the a liveaboard rig, like putting in a bed and uh, kitchen area and solar panels and um, you know uh, uh, well, all the electronics and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, I'll be, you know, I'll be doing that mostly by myself. So that'll take some time. That'll take some time, and uh, then hopefully uh, by the beginning of 2019, I will, uh, you know, have hit the road, and uh, I'll be heading south to Texas uh, first to go meet uh, Kyle Reardon, uh, my uh, co-host on the Vonnie podcast. I'm gonna gonna go down to uh, Austin, Texas, and meet him, and uh, go and uh, hopefully meet Cody Wilson and inter- interview him about, uh, you know, the Ghost Gunners and, uh, you know, the Liberator pistol, and uh, spend probably a week there, and uh, then head out to uh, Colorado. And um, hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll be around uh, the time where they'll start hiring for temporary positions, and I'll get a free ski pass, and I'll get to uh, you know ski, you know, for four or five months out of the year, and and you know, ski for free. So um, that's that's kind of my my first goal, and I don't know what, uh, yeah, I don't know what from there. Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, other than hopefully in 2020 in January, there's a uh, a big van nomad meetup uh, in Quartzsite, Arizona. It's called the uh, Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. Um, there were 4,000 uh, van nomads there uh, in 2018. Um, I, I need to make sure I can get out there because uh, a lot of these folks, uh, they really are venuans. Uh, they really are venuans. They just haven't heard of the term. And uh, when we talked about van nomadism so much on the Volney podcast over the span of uh, three months, um, I had five van nomads sign up sign up to support us on Patreon, and I had about 10 or 15 reach out to me with uh, you know pictures of their van and you know them uh, them traveling around and their their setups and all that. So it's been really really awesome because um, uh, it's. Uh, it's not just about being, you know, free by myself, but there are a lot of really awesome folks out there now. Um, and there are van nomad, you know, intentional community caravans and just really, really awesome stuff. So uh, it's a really, really freeing lifestyle. It's cheap. Uh, it's the cheapest lifestyle out there. Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm really, really excited for it. And I've got a lot of, a lot of really interesting plans uh, uh, as well um, for when I hit the road. But uh, for right now, they're just kind of ideas. They aren't really anything fleshed out. So I'm going to keep them to myself for now. Uh, and there's also one other related project, but I can't talk about that either. So, uh, <laughs> so there's some stuff behind the scenes that, that, that that's, uh, there's a lot of development going on. So, well, I, Hey, I have a question for you, Shane. Um, and I, this might be sure. a little bit more in-depth than, than maybe you were planning on going into. But, uh, I mean, van nomadism is something that, that really appeals to me a lot. I, I would love the idea to be able to kind of travel on my own and maintain my own small space wherein I live. I've always enjoyed mm-hmm. living in, you know, smaller spaces. I, I've never ever had the urge to have like a gigantic house you know we all have that fantasy where we have like you know this incredibly intricate floor plan whatever but like for me i would love to live out of like a a van an e-150 set up the way i wanted to set up um right how feasible is this with a family though because i i, yeah. I feel like because in you know my situation i have a daughter i have a daughter who's four years old 
And much as I would absolutely love to do it, I just don't think I could manage to do that. Um, not It's not anything against it. Believe me, if I could, I would. Um, but I, I, I'm curious if you've met any mm-hmm. other van nomads that have you know, young children or small children or do this as a family. Yeah, yeah. So there's actually quite a few out there. Yeah. Um, as far as them living out of vans, not so much. Um, a lot of like, uh, you know, for families, like they're more people, so they, they need more space. So a lot of times they'll step up to um, if it's going to be a van like a Dodge or Mercedes Benz Sprinter van um, there, you you a six foot tall, a six foot one person can stand up in them. Um, they're massive, like they're, they're massive vans. Um, so you pro- probably have to step up to that or uh, there's actually a, a couple of patrons of ours um, who um he's traveling with uh it's him his wife and three kids and they have uh, an rv and uh you know they're just traveling around florida right now so um there are a lot of them out there that do it um i it's it, it, it definitely changes the dynamic though um I, I i think it'd be more difficult to prepare for than you know for just just uh, for me by myself but there are definitely uh, folks out there doing it um hell there are even uh, you know families uh, you know that live on sailboats um so um, it, it does it does add to, to some yeah. difficulties. It, it does make it a little more difficult, sure. But um, you know, it's a it's a really great environment for the child to grow up in. Um, all of the all, like all of the you know I guess the uh, <clears throat> the vloggers that I, I follow on YouTube that do this uh, the families. Uh, you know the the children are you know they're 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 smart kids and they're always happy and or I mean obviously there's their children so the, there's obviously emotions that, uh, other emotions that come with it but still it's it's a really a really enjoyable life uh, you know life for 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 a child to grow up into so I, it it is feasible uh, it really is a lot of people are doing it but um, you know it's 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 not it's it's not for everybody so um, and that's something that's you know a lot of them emphasize it's not for everybody it really isn't. All right. I have another question that's not really related to this, but uh, given that we sure. all do stuff online and we have, you know, blogs and spend a lot, uh, a significant portion of our time, you know, trying to earn money through the work that we do online. Um, sure. How does running all of the electronics that you need to do everything work out of a van or out of a vehicle necessarily? Because, I mean, obviously yeah. you have to have it running in order to, to keep charging up the batteries, otherwise they drain you know, in an instant, but, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, so they're uh, the 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 most popular option is solar panels. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get uh, probably to to start two two hundred watt solar panels and uh, a Kodiak Energy. Uh, it's a it's a Kodiak Energy rig. It's uh, it's uh, comes with uh, the deep cycle battery with the inverter for refrigerator. Um, it'll be it'll it'll probably net out at you know for like four hundred watts of uh, of electricity, which will be God, God's plan to run everything I need to run. Um, I'll run a um, fridge off at all my electronics to to charge my phone um i'll have uh you know a, a small tv monitor in there and um i'll even have a a, a battery isolator too and i don't know what, what, if you want to don't, don't dive in uh, we're not going to dive into all of exactly how to do this because i don't understand it at this time um, but a battery <laughs> isolator so that if i um if say i'm parked in you know uh, like a wooded area and there's not that much sun and my batteries aren't charged up completely then i could i could take my van um, you know, just around the block, charge up, charge up both of my, you know, batteries for my solar, and uh, then I'd have enough power for three or four days, and I could just continue to, you know, to go around the block to charge up my stuff if I needed to. So um, that's actually not really one of the difficult obstacles. I mean, it's not expensive to do. Um, you could do your own, your own solar, your own solar build for a thousand dollars. Um, I'm going to spend probably 2000 on mine because I want to buy the Kodiak Energy. Uh, it already comes, you know, installed with everything you need. Uh, and I want to keep it simple. If, uh, if, there's, if, if I'm in the desert and my electricity goes down, I want it to be isolated to one thing, and it would be isolated to the Kodiak Energy. So um, it, it does cost quite a bit of money, but at the same time, um, it's, it's going to be an overall cheap home. Like, it's going to be less than $5,000. So, uh, so, yeah, that's, that, that's kind of what I, what I would say to that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, because I'm going to run into uh, we, we Shane and I talked this, about this a little bit earlier. That you know I'm going to run into this type of stuff when I when I'm kind of like winging that winging this van nomadism thing co- in a, a, c- coming up in a couple of weeks. But it it really doesn't require much, especially if you're just recording by yourself. 
you know, if you're doing solo stuff, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about internet con- internet connection at that time. And you only have to, wor- you just have to worry about the battery. Most, you know, if you're using like laptops and stuff like that, most of them have like a two or three hour battery life. And you, you know, you can usually get what you need to get done pretty quickly. I mean, I know for myself, I, because I'm doing this and I'm not, you know, I have a couple of, uh, well, right now one, and I'm I'm considering getting a second one, a foldable solar uh, charger. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm obviously not gonna go full scale solar panels right now because I'm just doing this for uh, for temporary purposes of the time being. But yeah, don't wanna don't wanna put any holes in your roof for a short venture. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but doing you know doing stuff like that, uh, prepping stuff like that, like Shane said, is really not necessarily that difficult. And also, you know, you don't really need much just to rec- if you're just going to record some stuff. And then once once you you know once you actually want to upload it, you just got to find some Wi-Fi. And that's you know same thing. Uh, you don't really need that much juice to do it for you know to do once if you have a good enough Wi-Fi connection, it'll upload pretty quickly, and then you're done. And uh, you know. And then if you're using right, other equipment, right. it and could I, be even I've got, easier. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'll have um, I'll have a a mobile hotspot that I'll use um, that I'll use occasionally. Um, but I actually have unlimited data uh, unlimited data plan on my phone. So I got uh, and I'm going to use this in the Midwest piece. Somebody fest, that's why I bought it early. But uh, it was like twenty bucks. All the Apple shit is really really stupidly expensive. Um, but it's a uh, it's uh, obviously the Lightning to a um, like a USB female. So I can plug in my my um, the microphone I use the ATR 2100 into my phone and it works. So I can get that great audio quality on my phone and I have a, a recorder on it too. Oh wow! Um, so I could I could you know record Skype calls on there um, and I'd be using my limited data plan. So it would not char- it would not cost me any extra. So um, I so I'm, I plan on being I, I plan on still being you know fully connected. There obviously be times where I'll just you know turn it all off because leave me the hell alone right um <laughs> as, we, as we talked about uh you know earlier jeremy um but yeah i, I there's there's a, there's a mo- all of the obstacles you know they have solutions like this is not uh, that difficult to do yeah it's uh you'd be amazed and you know just like anything else these days if 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 you think if you can think of a problem just go check youtube because somebody else probably already ran into it and has found a way to solve it <laughs> this is true we live in an incredible age of information uh, it's it it's a marvel to me every single day how much information you have at your fingertips. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 no joke. That's no joke. Um but I guess the the biggest obstacle for me uh was that um I'm a type 1 diabetic and that medication and the supplies are extremely extremely expensive. So um you know, uh, you know, full. T- I, I kind of need that, you know, full time healthcare to afford the U.S. medications. Well, U.S. medications. So <laughs> I, uh, you know, had this this brilliant idea to go to some go on go to a couple of the Van Nomad uh, groups on on Facebook, and uh, I asked them, you know, uh, are there any type one diabetic Van Nomads out there? How do you get your supplies? Um, and you know, it's Algodones, Mexico. Uh, they're they're known for their medical tours, and they've been featured in Forbes. Um, there's like 35 dentists on like one street. Um, you know, super. Com- super you know competitive great you know much for your market um and uh, you can get your your dentist work done there you can get all of your all of your pharmaceuticals uh you can get uh, any any other you know i guess uh, medical work you need done there and it's cheaper than in the u.s without that uh, without health insurance um so van nomads will go there you know once or twice a year to get dental work done and you know get their medications and then they'll travel back to you know wherever they were before and and that'll be the end of it um so yeah i'll be i'll be making a you know probably one or two trips a year to uh, to mexico uh as a, as a van nomad to, to get my diabetes supplies uh so you know it's a really really great option out there and it's sad because i i posted a uh uh, re- I shared I, I shared something on on Facebook. There was a guy in Cal, got a, a 26 year old kid in California, I think it was, who uh, he was off his parents' insurance plan, so he was rationing his insulin, and he died from diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so it's really sad that uh, you know. And this is this expands to politics too, um, you know. Like you, you have to work through politics to find freedom. Well, they don't see all the other options and solutions available to them. Um, so kind of the same thing with uh, with this kid that died from not have not having ins- having health insurance. I mean, it's sad that he didn't see all the options available to him. Just as a lot of people who really do want to be free don't see all of these uh, viable options available to them uh, in the form of freedom strategies. So, so yeah. Yeah, I remember. I remember hearing you talk about that story, and I was like, oh man, that's horrible. 
you know, of course, my first thought was like, well, if his parents knew he was off the insurance, why weren't they offering to pay for it if he was going to kill him? You know? Yeah. But then maybe he was rationing without telling them. I don't know. I, I obviously I didn't know the full mm-hmm. story, so I, I didn't stress on it too much. But yeah, overall, my I just my, you know my thoughts went immediately to like the conversations I've had recently with like you know when when I had to, when I talked to Mary uh, Doctor Mary J. Ruart uh, a while ago. It was like everything about the pharmaceutical injury uh, I- I- industry. It is so messed up, and it ends up doing things like this, unfortunately. Um, but you know, you mentioned obviously being able to do that and people do this all the time, but I just out of curiosity, man, I, I obviously have no idea. I mean, how long can you store, uh, insulin? If you were, you, you said you'd only go once or twice a year cause you, you can store it for up to six months at a time. I'm assuming then. Um, that's, that's why I need a refrigerator. Um, well, on, obviously with on, the refrigerator, I, 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 mean, I know that, but like, <laughs> you, I didn't know. Cause like I, even, even refrigerated, I know sometimes you can't store st- some of the stuff for too long. Yeah, so so if I take it out of the fridge, it has to be used within thirty days. Um, but in the fridge, you know, if I if I keep it for two years, it might lose a little bit of potency. Oh wow, but it'll okay. Still, it'll still be effective. Um, so I mean, I I plan on keeping a year or two on on board with me at all times, and that's what I'm doing right now. That's another reason I have to wait to do this because before I hit the road, um, before I quit my full time job, I want to have a year or two of diabetes supplies. So that's not an immediate freaking concern once I hit the road. Um, so I can get you know six months under my belt before I have to make a freaking trip to Mexico because uh, that's <laughs> yeah, no be kidding, no kidding. interesting to say the least. So, um, you know, I, I really want to hit the road now. Like if, if, if I could, uh, if, if I could, I would. But, uh, you know, looking at this since I, I'm only, I'll be 26 on Saturday. So um, I, I'm still young. Like I don't have to rush into this. Um, so if, if I'm 28 by the time I hit the road, you know, that's not really that bad. Um, I'm basically, you know, semi-retired by age 28. Um, so... So yeah, the, the, yeah, I'm the kind horror, of playing right? the slow game here. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh, I missed my yeah. window. It's like, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> you you got an early well, jump on this anyway. So yeah, exactly. You definitely have some room to play with that. Um, but before we go any further, since we since we always end up cutting them out of all these conversations, hey, Bueller, you have anything to chime in <laughs> over here? <laughs> well, I was going to say happy birthday, first off. Oh, thanks. For sure. uh, it's a little bit early, but by the time this comes out, you'll probably have had your birthday. And then uh, second off, uh, that place in Mexico sounds really cool. Um, as you were describing it, I couldn't help but think, you know, how many other people who aren't necessarily van nomads could benefit from something like that when it comes to healthcare. Oh, it could save so, a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm kind of falling in love with this whole idea of the van nomad uh, lifestyle as well, because um, I know Jeremy's getting prepared for it, and uh, it sounds like it would be really cool to go you know, on tour for a few months out of the year, at least. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I'll have you guys try it first and let me know what you think. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I'm most looking forward to, honestly, um, I'll plan my trips around uh, all of the Freedom Festivals. I'm probably going to stay away from the Freedom Conferences because those cost a lot of money. And, Van and they're boring anyway. A lot of yeah. money. But, um, you know, just plan my travels around all the Freedom Festivals. Um, so, you know, that'll kind of be my entire year. I'll just spend my entire year in second realms. So it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> that yeah, looking pretty cool. Looking forward to seeing you again at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest. Yeah, man, it'll be awesome. It'll be awesome. Yeah, it'll, yeah it's always great to see everyone again. But, uh, you know, the, the year takes forever, though. It really does. <laughs> yes. And, uh, I, yes. What was the name? Sometimes, except when you have kids, and then the year seems like it doesn't take any time at all. See, I don't what know about that, man. that place in Mexico? What's that again? Oh yeah. What was the name of that place in Mexico again? Algodones. Algodones. Uh, thanks. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely put stuff like stuff it's like uh, like a twenty five miles from Yuma, so it's it's right smack dab on the on the U S U uh, S Mexico border. So it's it's not a it's you, you could be in and out of there in an hour <laughs> and back to back to the U S. Um, Very I, nice. <laughs> Uh, I did just did just want to say quickly. I don't know about that, Andre, about the whole kids thing. I mean, yeah, definitely time speeds up, but it also slows down in other ways. So I have this weird conflict with my kids where everything seems to go go really really fast and take forever all at the same time. Um, yes, so I don't yes, know. <laughs> days. See, the Great. interior of days seem like they go on forever, but like once the day is over, it seems like you don't really count for how much time that day took. Yeah. So it seems like that day was over really quickly the next day. There you go. That that that, that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but any, as far as the, we talk about the MPL Fest, yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to being there too. And uh, But this this will still come out in time. Yeah, we're we're still a show or two ahead, but yeah, this will this will still come out in time. So there's still tickets if people uh, want to go ch- come join some of us there because like we said, Shane, Shane, and I will be there and a uh, whole bunch of other people. Lots of fun. 
what's, what's the website for that? Uh, MPLfest.org. Uh, still tickets available. Right. You missed the early bird, unfortunately, because this will definitely be out way too late for that. And uh, the early bird is already over. Yeah, yeah. but you, but, you could, but they're still relatively cheap. I mean, heck, even without the early bird special, I think the original price for four all, all the entire time for four people uh, was one hundred and eighty dollars. Um, so that's still that's a pretty good deal for four nights, five days um, of camping fun. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to going there too. And you know, you were, you were mentioning the whole, uh, cause Andre asked about the family thing earlier and you had, uh, you and I had actually discussed that earlier on your show, Shane, that there does seem to be an uptick in, you know, more people, including families jumping towards this. And a lot of things, you know, aside from the RV, one of my favorite things is the uh, converted school buses that a lot of people are doing. Uh, it's uh, the schoolies. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I know a couple of people personally that are, that have taken on that project and other people that have been successful with it in the past before too um you know i actually had dreams of you know aspirations of doing that at some point we'll see if that actually happens um but it does you know with the with me having children obviously it's a little bit different um but you know as andrew was asking before because you know it does sound appealing yeah we actually kyle turnblazer and i talked about this on a one of my recent podcasts about the whole idea of unschooling on the road and you know, that's actually one of my long term yeah. plans. I, I would love to do that with uh, with my kids. Like, you know, I still want to do the whole farming and the bison ranch thing. But my goal was to get it set up and running and hopefully be able to, you know, get other people working for me so I could take some time off on a fairly regular basis and just pick up and travel with my kids. And not only will they be, you know, learning on their own, but we'll be learning all over the place. And, uh, you know, what I, I can't think of a better education to give your child, honestly, <laughs> than having right, that right. much freedom um you know to just explore and learn and take on whatever they want to take on in a much more open setting than you know any of their friends could probably ever get <laughs> yeah yeah and it, it's worth mentioning too that uh you know van nomadism is a really really good interim lifestyle and obviously there are a lot of folks that are lifers that that do it forever um but it serves as a really really great interim lifestyle to get uh you know it's a it's a it's a good easy freedom strategy to or lifestyle change to you know knock out first before you go on to the ones that are going to get more and more complicated um so like alma Sommer, Sommer's uh, family did um they you know i guess leveraged van nomadism into uh, minimal sailboating um, you know, there are quite a few folks that, uh, um, that, that, that kind of do that. Yes, uh, Alma, for me, oh, just, um, I'm sorry, using... Sorry, I was just going to say, yes, I'm, I'm a form, former guest of the show. We had her on way back when she's the one who, do, she's the one who doesn't run the, uh, freedom, uh, the Jackalope festival in, um, <laughs> uh, Phoenix, Arizona. But yeah, her, yeah, she, her experience has been pretty interesting. I've been trying to follow what they, they've been doing. That's, uh, that's super intense. That, that, that's like a late, that's a, a long time dream for me being out of the water. I don't think my, my family and i would survive together out in the water though something i would probably just yeah that's 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 what that's i guess I, i've I'm, I'm using van nomadism as an uh van nomadism as an interim lifestyle for two things uh minimal sailboating that's been that was my first dream was minimal sailboating but i realized that that was a little far out there and i wanted to be free now so or free sooner um so so that's minimal sailboating or i still want to buy i still want to uh you know buy some land in southern illinois and homestead and have just a permaculture farm um, and spend, uh, you know, half the year there and half the, half the year on the road. And, um, yeah, my mom will, my mom will live, uh, you know, close by and she'd take care of everything for me too. Cause she'd get free vegetables. So I could, I could, <laughs> I could manage it. Nice. I could manage kind of either of these, either of these lifestyles. It's just, I, I want to get out on the road and then figure out what I want to do because I, I, I can't make that decision right now. I'll have to see, you know, a year, a year down the road or something like that. Now, uh, this sailboating actually kind of reminds me of seasteading a little bit, which I've heard you mention before. And uh, I'm actually very interested in seasteading as well. And I was wondering, uh, since I know you keep up on this, what do you? Uh, what's the current state of seasteading, and what are they planning on doing in the near future with it? Yeah. So um, the current state of seasteading. Uh, so Roger Ver and the Free Society Foundation they raised I think like a hundred million dollars privately um, to buy land from an existing go an existing you know nation or country or government or something like that um i haven't heard anything about that in probably oh eight or nine months i i haven't heard a thing so i don't think uh i don't think that's really progressing much um there was the um uh, the, the seasteading project i can't why can't i remember the uh 
Well, the the, the major sea setting project, the sea setting institute. Yeah. Um. So so French Polynesia actually canceled their contract with them, so they can't uh you know do their sea setting thing there. So I don't know what they're planning on doing now. Um. The those are both kind of at standstills it seems, which is uh you know. That's what's happened in the in the past. I was going to say, I was going to say, the ones that... in the past have gotten a little further. Oh, really? Um, in a couple instances, yeah, a couple see, couple instances. See, because that's funny. But, that's, um, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, isn't that the, isn't this the usual path how the, the path of how these go? But I didn't real. I thought these guys had actually gotten further. That's a shame. I, I thought they were doing even better work, but apparently they got held up even sooner. That's that's things. Yeah, I and I wrote an article on it. Uh, see, uh, uh, you know, learning from history, uh, learning from learning from the past, seasteading uh, case studies, or something along those lines. You just type in seasteading at uh, libertyunderattack.com. You can find it. Um, but uh, I, I went through all those all those case studies. But there was one, um, and it's been a while at this point. Uh, but there was one. They were they had a con a 99 year lease with uh, with the government to set up like a sovereign free port. Um, they got a little into it, and then the government realized they they weren't doing what they said they were doing. Uh, you know, they contractually agreed to, so they canceled it. Um, there's another sea setting venture that happened on the same island with the same dictator um, who just this time just outright canceled it, you know, just said, we don't have to uphold our end of the contract, get you know, get out. We'll, we'll just, you know, expropriate these resources. Um, then there was one uh, that was more kind of, uh, they were they were trying to, uh, you know, dredge islands. And uh, they, they wasted a lot of money. There was a lot of quibbling, and, you know, the project eventually died, and the king of Tonga came and, you know, kicked him out, so... Uh, I mean, there, there's a very, there's a really interesting history of these things that a lot of people, a lot of libertarians really don't know about. Um, but yeah, these were, you know, libertarian attempts to found new libertarian countries, and it hasn't fared very well. And uh, I don't think it's going to fare any time in the near future. Um, I really, really, uh, yeah, really don't. Um, but this more small scale stuff, uh, you know, that stuff's happening now. So it's it's not uh, you know this it's not uh, you know pessimistic at all. It's just that's that's uh, you know there there aren't uh, that many self liberators yet. Uh, you know there 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 aren't enough competent self liberators. So whenever that whenever that comes into fruition, then uh, we might see some of these more. Uh, I guess uh, grandiose projects. But for now, it's going to be more uh, peer to peer, individually based, that sort of thing. Not that it wouldn't be in those larger scale ones, but still. Well, yeah, and I mean, for the larger scale stuff, you're going to need more people invested into the project in order for it to succeed, right? It's, it's the more people there are invested, the less likely it is that one person pulling out is going to cause the total failure of the project. So, right, right, yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. That's definitely true. But um, yeah, I don't know where else. Uh, oh yeah, you're asking about the current state of seasteading. So yeah, I guess those are just those project projects are at standstill. I was the communication specialist for the Marinia project. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I was like, I remember you having a job with one of those organizations, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, it was, it was for about uh, four or five months, and um, yeah, they were, they weren't going to ask permission for, or they weren't going to ask permission from a government. They were going to do it in inter international waters. Um, so. They were uh, doing it the way that I, 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 that I think would be the most efficacious route to go. But uh, unfortunately, one guy was uh, Bob was paying out of pocket for the entire you know year the project was alive and spent a lot of money on it with really no returns. And the other members of the project weren't uh, you know I guess doing a whole lot. And um, one of me actually you know went uh, was was sent to a uh, sea setting project to promote Marinia and actually ended up joining the sea setting institute. So um, you know that one kind of uh, you know fell. It's it's uh, it's on uh, it's I guess it's. Uh, on hiatus is kind of what kind of what the website says, but you know if if they're you know funders that want to help us you know bring it back into bring it back to life or uh, you know something like that, then maybe. But I don't see that happening. Uh, I really don't. <laughs> right when I got in, I was starting to you know put together advertising and marketing plans. You know he just he, he brought this to me and I was like, Damn, <laughs> I, I, I just started to come up with some good ideas. Wow. I was thinking, you know, custom, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Marinia minted coins and just a lot of really and passports, a really a lot of really really cool stuff. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe you know, like you said, hope maybe, maybe somebody will help revive that. But that, I mean, aside from it being the trend of the these things never seem to get to get off the ground. Unfortunately, whether they got farther or not, the the overall trend seems to be that, unfortunately, doing stuff on such a large scale. Well, I mean, you know, small scale relatively, but larger scale than anything else that uh, you know people are doing. You know, on these individual type things unfortunately always seems to run into the issue that even if you try to do it in international waters you're always running afoul of 
different governments, you know, because even, right. uh, yeah. you know, being in international waters is not going to stop some, some government, like, I don't know, say the good old USSA from, uh, trying to, uh, find some way to get some kind of revenue out of you or cause some kind of trouble or whatnot, or can, or have right, you listed, right. or have you listed is, uh, as a terrorist, terrorist organization. And even on, even on land, people who attempt to do, and this, unfortunately I fall into this category because as I mentioned before, you know, part of the whole thing I wanted to do about originally was start an intentional community and also have the freedom as we were discussing before to, to travel at least part of the time as well but you know the threats of that even on land of course you know you look through the history of that you run into the you run the risk of having like you know the fbi or the dea or both um show up at your doorstep um and blow you up uh because you know you'll get labeled as an extremist just for wanting being wanted to left being wanting to left be left the fuck alone rather <laughs> um yeah so unfortunately as much as as appealing as those are even for somebody like myself it seems like the only possibility currently as in in the current as far as, as far as the for, uh, current form of government that we have to put up with you seem to be at a much more at a, be, a better advantage doing this on a more individual level uh because you it allows you more flexibility and therefore m more freedom <laughs> Right? Or am I yes, missing something? Yes, it, it, ex no, it, it, exactly, exactly. And there was a, an author uh, published a rich, originally in maybe the late 60s. Uh, it was called How to Start Your Own Country by Erwin Strauss. And uh, I agree with him on this. And I don't, I don't uh, you know, like the conclusion. But, uh, you know, Vaughn, it was, you know, premised on reality, not legality or anything like that. It's you know, premised on re reality. Um, but, uh, the only possible way that one of these libertarian, new libertarian countries could survive is if they had a nuclear weapon, you know, deterrent. That's the only possible way, um, because there's no way they could compete with the U.S. You know, the U.S. military. No way in hell that they could, you know, get to a point where they could have a military that could compete with it. Um, there's no way. Even if uh, you know Roger Ver and his folks are you know successful in buying a piece of land from a uh, an existing nation state. Um, why the hell wouldn't the nation state, uh, you know, not take the money and then just take the land too? Because what defense do they have? They have no defense whatsoever. It'd be well, stupid for them to give up territory. Um, I'm sure now Roger they could, could do... probably afford a deterrent. <clears throat> but he already explicitly McNukes, said the nuclear McNukes weapons for banned. everyone. Uh, yeah, okay. he already he explicitly said that. Yeah, um, yeah, that was one of the things. Um, so he says that you know nukes violate the non-aggression principle. And that's a philosophical discussion for another time. Um, but uh, I, I don't like I don't like the, I don't Roger, like the conclusion. Anyway. I wish I wish I wish that you know that seasteading was feasible and you know the invi the nature of governments now was you know they're more accepting to it but um obviously that's you know that's not not how it is. Um I I wish it was different but uh, unfortunately it's just not at, at this point. So um, I I think until space setting is a thing um I, I think it's really going to be more of the individual strategies uh like van nomadism or minimalist sailboating more of these uh, and you can have mobile intentional communities on the water. Um you could have you know a, a community of 25 or 30 boats and you could just always you know move around and travel around which makes you more invulnerable to coercion than you aren't a fixed item, you know, 100 miles off the coast of California. Um if you are then they're going to target you but if they really don't know you exist how the, how can they come pursue you all across the open ocean it's just not going to happen good point right on shane did you have something so, else to say or you started to say something before but oh i was just going to go on the little uh, private nuke rant and recreational nuke thing oh. <laughs> yeah well uh you know like i said i, I I'm, I'm obviously a big fan of this strategy and uh I'm definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm, as we discussed, I'm, I'm stepping into this kind of temporarily and kind of winging it, but I'm definitely looking forward to see what, seeing how you do it on a, on a, you know, setting out to do it on a more permanent basis, because, you know, as we're discussing, you don't really have too many options if you want to try to be free. So why not get out there and, yeah. attempt, and attempt to do it? Um, and as long as you can secure, I, I mean, obviously the, you know, securing, uh, fun you know funds and ongoing funds as you were discussing you know with with things like passive income and also possibly having you know do it you know freelance work seems to be the uh mm -hmm. yeah. digital seem, nomadism yeah you know, that that, that seem, seems to be the uh, big draw for a lot of people if they're already into stuff like that then absolutely i mean if you have a job where you don't have to be at one location at any one time then i don't i mean Obviously, yes. Other other than stepping down from certain comfort levels that we've all, you know, many people have become accustomed to and may not want to give up. I can't see any other reason to not want to try to do this stuff, especially in the in the current 
day and age when even even if you're in you know doing well or whatever, everything costs so goddamn much. <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, why wouldn't you like, even, even if you think government's a good idea for some reason, you got to be pissed off with how much money, you know, how much you're taxed at every level for everything, you know, like, why wouldn't you want to try to step away and, uh, you know, before, before the, before the next uh, real estate bubble, which is sure to come anytime now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the nature of the Cervall Society. Another another reason I'm quite happy I'm getting out of I'm getting out of real estate at least for the time being right now. <laughs> uh, especially considering when yeah. I got in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm 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 ready. I'm ready. To, I'm ready too. But yeah, it's it's it sucks. I mean, I really would hit the road tomorrow if I could. I, I really would. But uh, patience, patience. It sucks sometimes, but oh well. <laughs> It'll blow by. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, of course I, I understand that. I mean, uh, like, like you said, I, I'm, I'm on the cusp of it and I'm like at a point where, yeah, I can't wait to do it. And I'm also like, I don't have nearly enough time. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're never quite ready, but, uh, what should we call it? One, one thing I did want to ask you that I know you and I have talked about before mul- multiple times, both on your show and, and, and off the air as well. But, uh, I was hoping, uh, for our, for, you know, for our listeners to, uh, you know, get an insight on, uh, you know, one, one of the other things is talking about obstacles you may run into is, mm-hmm. you know, especially if you want to do the whole, you know, straight up van nomadism thing, and you're going to be on the road permanently, and like you're giving up whatever, you know, if you sell your house, or you know, don't you get rid of your apartment or whatever it is, and you, you know, you're living completely out of your vehicle. Um, then you obviously have to deal with things like, registering and insuring and all that stuff uh-huh. that you have to do for said vehicle. Um, and that could be, you know, I, if I'm sure for some people could say, well, what are you going to do then? And like, you have to pick a state somewhere and then how do you set that up or whatever? But apparently, and I was so thankful to find this information out because it's going to turn, turn, uh, come in quite handy for myself. But uh, apparently there has been, uh, at least one state in the union who has decided that this is an opportunity. There's a mar- there's a market opportunity for stuff like this mm-hmm. and they're going to hop all over it. Uh, I was wondering if you maybe would uh, share with, uh, with our audience, uh, what what that's all about <laughs> sure sure so so it, it appears the uh, the state the great state of south dakota is seriously hurting for revenue um yeah or they just or they're or they you know are acting in their market their limited market capacity to understand a, a market necessity but anyways anyways yeah south dakota guys south dakota i was actually born there and i might actually be a resident there oh that's uh, right i know, forgot that years without, without without i've never been back there since but uh you know my, i may you know end up end up in you know quote air quotes uh end up where i started but um yeah south dakota yourbestaddress.com now so the yourbestaddress.com is owned by our veers but i think they did some grassroots lobbying and uh you know made the uh you know the state of south dakota more i guess nice to uh to i guess our veers and to be more uh more i guess they they just kind of showed them the opportunity but so the first one is mail forwarding, uh, for twelve or uh, yeah, it's twelve dollars a month, which also serves as a it's a uh, it's a physical address. Now this isn't a PO box or just a mailing address. This is a physical address. street address. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can get uh, you know anything sent there. Uh, you know a lot of things like if they're government or banking documents, they won't send to a PO box if they're you know I guess maybe certified mail or something. I don't know all of the parameters, but some things can't go to PO boxes. And FedEx, um, and everything can go to, you, you, can FedEx go to and UPS. Or one of I, we're, we were talking about this earlier. I can't remember. It's either both of them or or one or the other uh, won't sh- uh, ship to those either. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's owned by Revere's. So the, the, the really neat, neat thing about this is, um, you can set up custom shipping schedules. So if I'm going to be in Denver, Colorado for two weeks working a temporary job, I can, you know, give them a call or send them an email and say, Hey, can you get this, uh, sent general del- delivery to this post office? Uh, I'd appreciate it. And they'd, they'd ship it out to me. They'd ship it out there and, uh, I'd get all my mail and I can get it whenever I want to. They'll, um, They'll uh, send you pictures at the front of uh, you know letters, so then they'll deal deal with your spam mail for you. Um, I mean, it's a really convenient service, and it's uh, we have twelve dollars a month. It's a uh, it's a it's a it's a heck of a deal. Um, basically, yeah, all fan nomads use that service. Yeah, it's 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 pretty insane. I was I I actually spoke to uh, somebody at their organization today because I'm I'm looking into doing it for myself because I'm gonna not have a physical address in a couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, even if like if you sign up for like the I think if you sign up for a year you get a you get a month free and uh, you know you have to pay like there's a one time twenty dollar fee that you have to pay to sign up and then after that you don't have to pay that again you just pay whatever however many months and you can do it you can sign up for six uh, three months six months nine months or the full year, um, and then you get all you know like Shane was saying all 
all the all these different things. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, just the fact that you can get it shipped, you know, whenever and then, uh, uh, you know, wherever you're going to be is so ridiculously convenient rather than getting a P.O. box in a certain state and then having to go back to that place. It's a lot place. cheaper than a P.O. box, too. I looked into that a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I looked into a P.O. box and they're they're a lot more expensive than your best address dot com. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's quite a bit more. Yeah. So and and that's not all either. There's the, the doing this if if you follow this route and decide you want to get yourself a street address in South Dakota for whatever reason. And it is I actually love the fact that of the re- possible reasons that you could need it, like on the website where it talks about oh if you're looking to do this 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 and this and this if you need you know if you're an RV or blah 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 the very the one of the, the second to last one is actually if you're concerned about privacy. Like they actually have that. I love mm-hmm. that. I thought that was so great. Like, right. yeah, if, if that's your only reason that you want to have this. Um, but that, that like, I, I feel like uh, one of those announcers like, but that, but wait, that's not all. Um, this is actually the stepping stone for some other things you could do in South mm-hmm. Dakota, right? Then this is actually just the very oh, first yeah. step, which you could set up online and have all taken care of within 24 hours. You have your own address, correct? I believe that's the deal. Um, yeah, like yeah. That. So that's that's yeah, that's the uh, that's the physical address. It's uh, easy to do. Yeah, super super easy to do. Um, so once you and, and and the yeah, the best thing is that you can you can build on top of this. Uh, so once you have your 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 physical address with yourbestaddress.com and uh, I they aren't, I don't they don't sponsor me or anything like that. That's just a really awesome you know service. Um, but um, so vehicle registration. Well, hopefully uh, they will. Do, if, maybe maybe if we tag them in all these episodes, we'll get them to give you a sponsorship <laughs> for all the work you do. <laughs> maybe maybe. <laughs> maybe who knows uh, but yeah vehicle registration now uh here in the uh in the great communist state of illinois um it costs uh what, what was it uh well, i guess for my vehicle registration is like a hundred and 128 dollars uh here uh, in the u.s for it's it's for a year 128 dollars um, for a year that's even more expensive than new york wow yeah 128 dollars a year um and that's that's vehicle registration for Mercury Grand Marquis in 1998. Well, in South Dakota, wow. you can get your vehicle registered um for it's uh, forty five dollars per vehicle. So <laughs> that's uh that's quite uh it's quite the savings. Um also if you're buying a uh you're buying a new or used vehicle, um so the the excise tax here in Illinois is six point two five percent. It's four percent in uh, South Dakota, and I, I, in my book, I put this in there. I'll see if I can get the numbers right. But uh, <clears throat> if I were to buy a $30,000 Chevy Express um, in Illinois, I'd pay like $700 more than I'd pay if I, if I registered, registered through South Dakota. So I'd save like $700. Um, so that was just the example I used. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, quite a bit of savings if you're buying a new vehicle. If you're buying a $3,000 used one, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. But um, yeah, whatever. Uh, so that's uh, vehicle registration. You can do that without even going there. Uh, you just, you know, download, you, you print out the forms, fill them out and scan them back and, you know, they'll, they'll get, your, your, get you your vehicle registration. Um, you can also become a resident of South Dakota in less than 24 hours. Um, so, so how this works is um, this is this is my there, sorry, you, I'm sorry. I was just going to say this is my this might be my favorite part of the whole thing, which I which again I may <laughs> actually end up doing, um, depending on how my situation pans out over the next couple of weeks. I may actually be ma- making a trip to South Dakota to do what uh, Shane's about to talk about. <laughs> yep, yep. So, all you have to do to become a resident in South Dakota, you have to drive out there. And stay one night in an RV park, Airbnb, hotel room, uh, or whatever. Get a receipt. Uh, take that and you know your normal proof of identification, your normal proof of identification, so Social Security card, and um, uh, you, uh, whatever else, whatever ID, else yeah. it is for. ID, license, yeah, ID verification nonsense that you have to, that you have to deal with with any government. Um, you uh, take that in there with your receipts, and uh, they'll you know go to the DMV. They'll give you a driver's license, and you can you know become a resident there in 24 hours. Um, so there's there, there's a lot of reasons that people you know choose to do this through South Dakota. They have uh, like no personal income tax, no state and no state tax, or like there's a lot of benefits, a lot of savings, a lot of conveniences. So, um, so yeah, it's it's really it's yeah become a, become a resident under 24 hours. That's how that's what they advertise. So, it's pretty crazy, man. It really is. Um, and for a lot of folks, like um, like maybe you, you know, it might be worth it to take a trip out to South Dakota to to actually pursue this. And uh, I will sometime when I hit the road, maybe uh, maybe a couple of years in, because I, I don't want to be a resident of uh, of, uh, the commie state of Illinois anymore. I'm kind of <laughs> over it. It's too expensive. Not as bad as New York, Jeremy, but it's it's close. 
Well, uh, well, as as we just learned, it's actually more expensive in some regards. Um, but yeah, like I said, I did this part. I, I absolutely love, and you know, you you have to spend that one night out there, and then in order to renew it, isn't it only something like every couple of years? You only have to do the same thing. You only like every two, yeah, or five, have, every five years four, or something, four or five years. Yeah, for for the driver's license, I think you have to go stay one night there every five years or something like that. Yeah. Um, in order to, in order to have a residence, like so, so then you literally, according according to every other legal, you know, legal, uh, you know, jurisdiction you'd have to deal with around the country, uh, especially you know, which is especially important as we're talking about for like a van nomad who is going to be traveling a lot. Then, uh, for all intents and purposes. You are you you live in South Dakota as far as they they're concerned. Which mm-hmm. I remember you mentioning earlier tonight. Uh, I think it was the other show other show we were doing. The whole fact about uh, which I hadn't even considered, uh, which is actually very valuable information for me. The fact that you know if you're out there, you know whether you're somebody like me just testing out stuff like this, or somebody like yourself who's gearing up to do this on a more permanent basis for a while. If you happen to encounter police for any reason along your travels letting them, you know, telling them that you're homeless is not a good idea. Like telling them that you're nope. living out of your car is not a good idea. Like I you're like on vacation. Yeah, exactly. You're on vacation. Ex- they love to harass homeless people. Exactly. Yeah, the like, Bludgies hate the homeless. Yeah. Hadn't even crossed my mind, but that's great information to have. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, and this, that further solidifies it if you have these plates, because as we also discussed earlier, unfortunately, there's plenty of jurisdictions across the country that if you're traveling through it with plates that don't match the state that you're in, a lot of cops do have the tendency to target people like that. Like we were discussing earlier, I know Pennsylvania is like that. Yep. Um, I've always had issues in North Carolina, although as I've, as I, as I also mentioned, even if certain states, the cops don't normally do stuff like that. Every one of them targets New York, New York drivers. Um, that's because it's, you know, New York, New York is universally hated. That's, that's a given, um, <laughs> uh, but you do have to deal with other than having to deal with that type of stuff. At least you can say, Oh no, I'm just, I'm just on vacation. Cause this is my home. This is where I live. And they have no idea that where yep. you live is actually a, uh, a, a box in a, 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 some kind of, some kind of magical box in a suite in a office building in, uh, in, in, in the state of South Dakota. Um, anyway. Yeah. And, and you don't, have, you don't have to lie to them. Um, and you yeah. don't want to lie to government agents. You just say, I'm on vacation, which that's not a lie. Uh, and then, um, <clears throat> and, uh, then when they ask, um, Oh, what was I going to say? Um, Oh, of, uh, just yeah. The, the, then, whenever they look at your driver's license and see uh, your your best address on there, whatever that is, uh, you don't have to you you don't have to say anything other than that's my physical address, and you aren't lying to them. It it really is your physical address. Um, but uh, you know you don't have to you know spill out the details that you don't actually live there. So um, there are a lot of ways to deal with uh, deal with the bludgies here. Now this now these sorts of things were the were, was the, were, those were the main reasons why Rayo decided that uh, he'd rather go live in a polyethylene A10 than Siskiyou National Forest. Um, so yeah, they. Are they're uh, you know definitely inconvenient. Uh, they they that they, they definitely are. Um, but yeah, as far as dealing with the bludgies, I mean there are ways there are ways around that. Uh, it's also worth noting just the Servile Society in general. They aren't they're, they're very hostile towards uh, you know generally uh, towards alternative lifestyles. Um, there there have been plenty of reports of uh, you know man nomads walking out uh, and they're or, you know, you know, walking out from you know the grocery store or something, their windshield will be smashed. Um, or they'll deal with you know vandalism. Um, a lot of them will get the uh, the bludgies called on them, obviously, um, and that's why stealth camping is so important. If you're going to be staying in the city, make it uh, no one can know that you're sleeping in there, or else you probably will get harassed. So, um, so yeah, there's a, it's 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 an unfortunate uh, you know obstacle dealing with the bludgies and dealing with uh, I guess just uh, the general perception of the lifestyle that she, that you uh, may choose to live. So, yeah. Well, one thing I do want to mention with uh, regards to making your physical address in uh, South Dakota. And this is from a purely uh, legal perspective. Um, I'm not sure. Sh- I, like I, I, I can't speak intelligently uh, whether or not there's case law, there's precedent uh, regarding whether or not uh, if you are a resident of South Dakota and you maintain a physical address in South Dakota, whether you're considered domiciled in South Dakota. But uh, I mm. do want to bring it up because it is an issue that uh, anybody who is who wants to pursue that should keep in mind because you can be. Like, for example, if somebody wants to sue you for something, say, I don't know, you have a work contract, something or other. Um, anybody, if you're considered domiciled in the state of South Dakota, anybody who has a claim against you can go to South Dakota and file that claim in a South Dakota court. And then you will be served to go back to South Dakota to appear hmm. 
with regards to the claim that's being served against you. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So yeah, I'll look into that. So while while I absolutely love it, I do think people should be aware that legally speaking, if your physical address is in right. South Dakota and you're considered a resident there for whatever purposes you want to do that for van nomadism or just for, you know, generally wanting to maintain your privacy and not not have to disclose, you know, your actual physical location. Um, mm -hmm. that does impose on you the legal obligation to show up in court there. Otherwise, if you don't, enough, yeah. you know, same thing that happens if you don't show up in court in any other place, you have a warrant out right. for your bench warrant for your arrest. So, um, that's something that I wanted to bring up that came to mind. Fair enough. Yeah. That, and that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, yeah, I'll have to, I'm going to look into that, um, see if there are any uh, legal interstices available. Uh, or any uh, jurisdictional uh, arbitrage. Okay, we'll, we'll <laughs> I let the first couple go. You keep dropping terms that I don't know if all of our audience are going to, are going to know. A legal interstices was just the last one. I don't Fair know. Enough. <laughs> Fair enough. You got to be careful, man. Remember, it's been a while. I don't know if everybody's. Uh, you know, obviously, we're going to put a lot of links in the show for you to go if you haven't. If this is the, your first time hearing about <laughs> Vanu and uh, Van Nomad, yeah, well, I'll, I'll then, send you uh, a link to the definitions page. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll put a lot of links in the show notes for everybody. But uh, just because Shane's dropped a couple of terms in the past uh, twenty minutes or so, you may. Not have heard before like servile society and stuff like that i obviously understand it all because i listen to the project uh, the podcast regularly um but in case you're not well we'll throw all that stuff in for you later <laughs> we're all not right. going to leave you hanging yeah, we're not so, those kind of people <laughs> yeah. and uh when right he's, when he's when he says bludgies he means road pirates yes aka cops. Yeah, yeah, pick the, your favorite the popo. <laughs> yeah, blood, bludgies. I'm actually a huge fan of. I, I picked that up as well from uh, Rayo's writings and stuff. And it was it's actually my preferred term to use for them. Uh, uh, although my my although road pirates is perfectly acceptable. For, for me, especially because that's the term my kids use for them, um, which, uh, as I've mentioned before, my proud, my <laughs> proud, my, 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 my proudest moments are when they use the term in front of their grandfather, who is a retired New York City uh, police officer, <laughs> and uh, that makes that makes Jeez. me the happiest of all. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know about you guys, but it makes me feel like I'm in Mad Max. Like it, yeah. if I talk about road pirates, it makes me feel like every time I get onto the highway, it's like you know Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome or Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, yeah. Dodging yeah. Road kind of that, 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 that <laughs> could be dangerous for me. I, I'm bad enough when I'm, uh, you know, I used to, I mean, way back in the day, and obviously the statute of limitations, if there is any, would, would be way over at this point. So I'm safe. Um, but I used to drive uh, uh, back in the days when I was big into the uh, the ecstasy scene. And uh, it was bad enough back then when I would get into like video game mode. Um, like how I didn't hurt anybody or myself is beyond me. Um, but I can imagine just thinking like, I don't want to think of myself in Mad Max. That could get dangerous for me. <laughs> I can start weaving it and think I could just run over people. Um, anyway, <laughs> not good. I need to be uh, smarter when I drive. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so uh, oh, there's, oh, oh, I was going to say uh, the uh, the one thing I obviously the point Andre brought up about the whole the whole legal aspect is uh, is definitely an important one. I will venture to say, though, that based on the fact that you are you are able to get not only a physical street address given to you, but then after that, a driver's license and a residency, I'm pretty sure that you're going to be considered domiciled there. Um, so yeah, as, yeah, as that, that would be my that would be my guess as law. I mean, and this is something that people run into because I know and, and this is something you've talked to about on your your other podcast too. I think probably Vanu too, but on your other podcast, the uh, Liberty Under Attack, um, stuff about like the people who go all around the world. Like, what's the one guy who travel who's uh, basically a Oh, perpetual traveler. Yeah, uh, that's the term. Pete Thank Cisco. You. Pete Cisco. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you know, if you're doing stuff like, even if you're doing stuff like that, you know, uh, eventually you're going to have to deal with your your because of the way all most of the countries are set up, you're going to have to have some kind of home base. Unfortunately, like that's just kind of the way it ends up working. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't think you can do any. Like, I mean, you'd be stuck somewhere. You might be able to. You might the government might the government there might leave you alone. But if you have none of that, if you have none of that, like no residency, no passport, no anything, I mean, you just wouldn't be able to leave the country. Um, exactly. There are some. Yeah, and there are um, there are actually I'd, I've come across that in a couple uh, you know Van Nomad blog vlogs people who are traveling across Mexico. There are folks who you know they uh, you know traveled down there, married someone, got divorced, and they got rid of their U.S. passport because they were married to this woman. Then they divorced him, and now they were stuck in the country, um, you know, without any way to you know to to, to get out of there. Um, so yeah, that's that'd be a bad situation to be in. Uh, it really really would be, um, and I think it's actually probably illegal too. But um, 
Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I guess the yeah the the idea with that is to to choose uh, as your I guess your your residency somewhere with uh, you know I guess uh, you know a tax haven sort of place. Um, and I have Pete's just going a little more detail into that the five flag theory, and you can you can look that up. Uh, uh, it's called the five flag theory, but yeah, there are, yeah difficulties for sure. Oh sure, but I mean you know like we're saying you're gonna have to have some type you're going to have to have a home base somewhere even if you want to travel outside the U.S. But if if you were planning on having like a home base within the U.S., even if you're going to be a van nomad, uh, nomad, then at least prepare. You know, as Andre was saying, be prepared for that very real possibility, and just you know prepare accordingly. And as long as you you know know that going ahead, you know going ahead, then that's fine. If you were going to have a home base anyway, why not have it be there? Because as far as like you know, you're talking about tax havens and stuff. Based on you know the information that I've been able to you know that that they give on that website, and I've also been able to verify otherwise, um, it seems like as far as like tax havens within the U.S. go, it's not actually a bad one. So <laughs> you know you might why and, why, I mean, why I, not why not choose South Dakota if you're gonna pick if you're going to have your home base somewhere in the U.S. anyway. You know what I mean? Oh, right. Yeah. Right, it makes it makes you more invulnerable to coercion because you aren't going to have state state government goons coming after you for any income tax that automatically cuts your coercion in half. Uh, well, oh, I guess yeah. it probably more exactly. like eighty to 20, 80, 20 percent. But you you get what I'm saying. You you only have one government agency coming after you. You have the IRS, not just the you know. So it, it's all about limiting the coercion, and that's utilizing legal interest. I see. So don't rely upon them, but um, at the same time, uh, you know they can be very very useful, um, such as utilizing uh, you know what's available in South Dakota. And I mean, I don't want to give anybody the impression listening that like this is some, you know, huge, you know, ominous burden about being hailed into court. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not no, like it's a, it's a real possibility, to, especially. Well, yeah, of course. I just I just don't want to give the impression that this is like, you know, oh, if you don't think about this, you know, you're going to get screwed left and right in every which way and you're never going to be able to survive. It's not anything like that. Most of us, you know, never see the inside of a courtroom. Most of us are never going to end up in a lawsuit over something. But I mean. Or, it is something that you do have to keep in mind. So exactly, that's why. And right. since I had learned about it this semester in my first or in my uh, last semester of law school, I wanted to impart what knowledge I had, what expertise I could give, <laughs> and uh, share it with sure. everybody. So that way, I can expand the conversation well, as best I can. That's that's why we have you here, Andre. So yeah, you, well, I mean, that, I'm you better be bringing so the goods. Damn it! Well, you know, <laughs> use that knowledge for something, right? It doesn't do any good just sitting in my brain. Uh, absolutely right. yeah it's some some important to keep in mind yeah yeah it's important to look at all of these things and i mean i mean it's all about uh you know becoming as involved to coercion as possible and getting dragged into a government court is something you want to avoid at all costs so um i think most venuans you know limit conflict as much as possible because conflict can lead to coercion and that's not good for, exactly. for anybody so um i i think most venuans kind of keep to themselves or they are just uh you know they, they, they don't get involved in conflict much so you know i, I don't think there's there's too much of a risk of that but yeah, sure. You know, if you piss the wrong person off, I mean, if you're an anarchist, I mean, you're already kind of, uh, you know, on people's bad list. So um, always better to be prepared. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I'm looking at the clock and uh, we've been going a little over an hour now, so we should probably get wrapping up soon. Uh, but before we get going, first of all, uh, this is uh, Shane. Thank you very much for coming on. This has been great. Uh, so I'll let you go first and, uh, you know, say anything you want to say in closing. And of course, uh, plug, plug, plug away. Um, and it will, I'll, I'll obviously put everything else in the show notes too, but, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you want to say, say, say it, please go, 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 sir. Go. <laughs> sure. Sure. So, uh, so yeah, I guess uh, I'll, I'll leave your listeners with this. Even if you aren't sure what you want to do, even if uh, uh, you have no idea, this would have been where I was two years ago. Um, there are two things that I should have I should have been doing um, that uh, I think most uh, most individuals should do, just as you know, uh, to increase their personal freedom. But uh, those things would be make your make your uh, your job you know location independent. That's huge because that sets you up sets you up for basically any of these lifestyle changes. Uh, if you can already have that going in, that's one major thing out of the way. How you're going to make money on the road. Um, so you uh, make your job, you know, location independent, or I guess just work towards financial independence. So, uh, you know, where a job becomes optional, or where you only have to work part time to um, cover your uh, cover your expenses, and that's it. I mean, that's kind of the idea. So, um, location independent job, and you know, pursue financial independence. If you want more information on financial independent early retirement, you can go to vonniepodcast.com. Um, we did we've done a bunch of episodes on that, in season two and in season three. 
Um, so yeah, vonnypodcast.com is where uh, you know all that all that stuff is at. Uh, you can find a bunch of free Vonny publications that I've digitized, uh, both of Rayo's uh, his first and his second book. Uh, second books, those are both on there. Uh, the audiobook for the first one is up. I still need. To, I've got a lot of audiobooks I need to do. It's just I I don't have time to do them. Um, <laughs> so you can get all that stuff there. Um, I also do Liberty Under Attack Radio. Uh, we talk a lot of direct action. Uh, you know, it's uh, Vaughn. It's you know, Vaughn is direct action, but we just go more generally over on uh, Liberty Under Attack. Uh, that's Liberty Under Attack uh, dot com. And the last thing I want to mention is that I just uh, re- I'm trying. One of my paths to passive income is I have this thing called Liberty Under Liberty Under Attack Publications, where you know I release anthologies and audio books of you know various things. I've never done much with it, and I never actually promote it. Um, so I'm actually going to start you know utilizing that. And uh, I digitized, uh, or I guess I really didn't digitize it. I you know formatted it for Kindle and put it in paperback edition. It's a book called Hashtag Agora, and uh, it's a really really awesome you know crypto anarchist uh, agorist novella. Um, so that's uh, you know pretty. Uh, pretty incredible i'd recommend uh, people check that out on amazon um it's uh just search for hashtag agora shane radliff and you'll you'll find it uh, up there so um that's uh that's all i've got uh if, if any of your listeners are interested in personal freedom i mean uh lua and the vani podcast are, are i guess two 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 great routes to go uh, and obviously in, in my humble opinion <laughs> uh so uh thanks guys for for having me on i appreciate it and, and shane it was nice to, to chat with you again and uh, jeremy it'll be nice to both of you guys uh, at the midwest peace and uh, liberty fest uh, next month Right on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, I, I will second what you said about your, I, I'm, I, I, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, both of your shows. So, yeah, I would definitely encourage everybody to go check those out if you haven't uh, already. Uh, Sh- uh, Shane Buell, Buell, so we don't get confused. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you I'll get, let you go next since, of course, you ended up getting, uh, you know, X out of most of the conversation because you're just not assertive enough, right enough man. We need you to uh, step up every more often. Uh, more yeah. Often. Well, when it comes to uh, Vonu and especially Van Nomadism, uh, Shane has really done his homework and he seems to be uh, planning his own uh, trip out in a very organized fashion. And uh, I know that Jeremy's got to kind of jump into this uh, with both feet because of his situation, but it's really good to have this kind of information handy for, well, Jeremy's situation and for anyone else who's interested in van nomadism and uh, von, Vonu in general. So uh, I just want to thank you for all the work that you do. And uh, um, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Uh, Andre, anything before we get going, man? I think he stepped away. Oh, of course. I wasn't supposed to throw That's right. We weren't supposed to throw to Andre because he may have to step away to take care of his daughter. So uh, unfortunately, Andre may not make it, make it back before the end of the show, but that's all right. Um, anyway, so once again, Shane, thank you very much for uh, coming on. This is great. And uh, I, again, I will for put sure. all those links in the show. And yes, as was mentioned again, uh, please, anybody, the... Uh, Michigan Peace, uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest. If you're uh, anywhere, anywhere close, I mean, heck, close. I'm coming from 11 and a half hours away, so uh, if I can do it, so can you. Um, I'll throw those links up there too, and uh, please consider coming out and seeing at least the three of us and plenty of other people. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, thanks everybody for listening. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, all of our information can be found at solpodcast.org. Uh, Patreon still up and running, uh, back on track again after, uh, flubbing up the past couple of weeks, but, uh, we're back on track with all the episodes. Uh, that's uh, still at uh, Patreon slash seeds of Liberty. And of course, uh, Patreon, uh, Patreon, geez, I'm all right. Uh, steam it for, uh, steam it slash at seeds of Liberty and at abolitionist J. Uh, if you want to, if you're on steam it, you want to throw us some, uh, little love that way too. That always helps, you know, upvote and re-steam our stuff. We love that too. Uh, so anyway, once again, thank you everybody for listening and we will catch you next time. Peace. Peace.
This is Daryl W. Perry, host of Free Talk Live. This November, I'll be running in the world's biggest and most popular marathon, the New York City Marathon. And I've accepted a spot on Team Innocence Project because I'm a passionate supporter of their work. Since 1989, 353 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, including 38 who pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, and 20 of whom served time on death row. The Innocence Project provided direct representation or critical assistance in 180 of these cases. With your help, the Innocence Project can help even more people who have been wrongly convicted. As part of Team Innocence Project, I am raising awareness about wrongful convictions and raising funds to help free the innocent. I've already paid the race registration fees. However, to secure my spot on Team Innocence Project in the New York City Marathon, I need to raise $3,500 by November 1st. You can support the Innocence Project and help me secure my race entry by going to run.freetalklive.com.